Without further ado, welcome to the first talk in Tent Pa at SHA 2017. Um, Einstein once uh, described it as a spooky action at a distance. Now we're building communications networks with them. Um, <laughs> we're building uh, communication networks that could provide a fund fundamentally secure way to communicate where the privacy um, would be built at a physical level, and this sounds really awesome and interesting. So here to present her invitation to help her us build a quantum internet is Stephanie Werner. Please give her a very warm round of applause. Well, thanks for the nice introduction, and thanks all for coming here after dinner or before dinner or after drinks or before drinks, I don't know. Um, so before kind of I start with uh, talking about the quantum internet, which uh, I guess on the first slide might indeed uh, seem a bit spooky, I want to ask you a question. Namely, I want to ask you what happened on the 29th of October 1969. Any takers? Huh? Start of the internet, very good. We have experts. We are, of course, at Shao Wan. So in 1969, the internet, I guess as it's known today, was slightly smaller. Uh, and in fact, I guess at this time it was called ARPANET, and it consists of only four nodes connecting a few universities in the US, uh, namely UCLA in Los Angeles, uh, Santa Barbara, uh, Stanford, and the University of Utah. So like on this day, these guys, in fact, made the first transmission over the, I guess, this early packet switch network. And you can see that they are working very hard. So at 9, 10:30 uh, in the evening, they tried to kind of communicate over this network. And I guess, as the story goes, this communication was not so easy at this point. So they, in fact, wanted to call each other on the phone in order to verify that the transmission worked correctly. Okay. So Charles Klein was down there in, in Los Angeles and he called up to Stanford to verify whether the kind of packets actually arrived. So they call each other on the phone and they type an L and they ask CDCDL. And they get an answer and it says, yes, we see the L. Okay. And it's excellent, we've just kind of transmitted the first message over what is now with the internet. So they type the O and they ask on the phone, did you see the O? And the reply comes, yes, excellent. We, we did see the O. So they typed the next letter and in fact the system crashed. So at this point in time, like uh, sending messages over the classical internet was not so easy. Of course we know that it works something like this. Um, so this is kind of our, our WhatsApp group at QTech. And we can now quite confidently kind of send messages over the classical internet, even pictures. Um, uh, at any point a day. Okay. Right. So what I want to talk now is, I guess, let me say, taking this to a, to a next level, namely instead of kind of talking about the classical internet, which I guess you're all familiar with, I want to talk about the quantum internet. So this is some effort actually that we have in Delft. Of course, there's other people working around the earth. So this is, um, I guess, the effort that requires, of course, a lot of people to be involved. So at QTech, kind of one of our goals, in fact, is to build the quantum computer. And one of our goals is to realize the quantum internet. Kay? So these are some of my colleagues, so Ronald and Tim, who kind of work in the lab. They kind of make hardware. And David, who's one of my theory colleagues, and that's myself. And we also have an engineering team at TNO, which is very essential um, in order to realize this. Kay? So we're currently working quite hard um, to kind of achieve this 2020 goal of actually setting up a demonstration network here in the Netherlands. Um, incidentally, I guess we're aiming it to have four nodes, that's very convenient. Um, connecting Delft, where of course we are, The Hague, which is decently close, and Leiden and Amsterdam. So we are of course not alone in the work, so we are part of the uh, European Quantum Internet Alliance, which kind of con uh, contains some of our collaborators, um, uh, who kind of help us realize this goal. So of course, you might now be asking the question, so what is a quantum internet? And kind of what makes it different from a classical internet? 
So I'm have painting here sort of a cartoon of a quantum internet um, that, just like in the classical network, you can imagine that kind of the quantum internet connects computers, but of course in this case not um, classical computers, but actually quantum computers, um, by kind of optical communication. Kay? So kind of the aim of the quantum internet is to enable quantum processors to kind of exchange qubits potentially over long distances. And kind of exchanging qubits, they might also sort of um, create entanglement between them as by this purple line. So the ultimate, I guess, dream or the vi grand vision of a quantum internet is to enable quantum communication or the generation of entanglement between any two points on Earth. So you're probably getting a bit worried about this, given that you've sort of read about the quantum computers and you're thinking, you know, yeah, they're building the quantum computer and now also the quantum internet. And she's telling me that like taking a making a quantum internet is like attaching quantum computers to optical communications. First, I need a quantum computer, and then I also need to connect it. It's hugely complicated. So kind of the nice thing maybe about quantum communication is that it derives its power, I'm going to say a bit more about this, from quantum entanglement. Of course, quantum computers also do that, but the quantum computer kind of becomes interesting as long as soon as kind of you have a number of qubits or quantum bits, then you can no longer simulate efficiently on a classical supercomputer. Because, you know, why get a quantum computer if I can run it on a supercomputer? So in contrast to that, kind of all applications of a quantum internet derive their power from entanglement, and already two qubits can be entangled with each other. So it actually turns out that in order to do something useful with this, we don't need very large quantum computers, meaning very many qubits, but actually relatively modest-sized quantum computers are already sufficient. So let me maybe say a little bit on why one might actually want to do such a thing. Apart from the fact that, of course, it might be cool to generate entanglement between any two points on Earth. So there are, of course, some applications, and I guess probably the most well-known, which maybe here I don't need to explain in such great detail, is the fact that we can use it to communicate securely. And I'll say a bit more what this means in a second. But even though, of course, everybody usually thinks about secure communication, as in fact the introduction um, already highlighted, there's actually very many other things that one can do using quantum communication. And yes, I know that we are at Char, so probably secure communication is kind of important, but there's other interesting applications actually, which are maybe a little bit well less, less well known. So one of them, for example, is the fact that quantum communication allows you to synchronize clocks much more accurately than can be done using classical communication. In fact, if you want to get a bit crazy, you it can also be used to extend the baseline of telescopes. So essentially how this works is that you have two telescopes which might be very far apart, and you can think that kind of one particle of light is being actually teleported using entanglement to the other telescope where you can do an interference experiment. So this allows kind of the extension of baselines kind of over much larger distances. Of course, we can use it to kind of test various aspects of physics, for example, gravitational effects, if you care about such things. Um, but just like a quantum computer can lead to exponential savings in time, that is much faster. A quantum internet can, in principle, lead to exponential savings in communication. So there are certain tasks for which I need to exponen communicate exponentially fewer quantum bits than I need to communicate classical bits. Now, of course, as I'm going to tell you shortly, communicating quantum bits is pretty hard. So you might say, you know, yes, there are some exponential savings, but it's like super hard to send these qubits around. So of course, exponential is like a dramatic scaling, okay? It's like a... Um, um, so even though I might need kind of exponentially more classical bits, um, it might still be worth sending qubits. But if you're not convinced by this, um, and like I said, there's many more applications actually that I'm not mentioning in here that are related to synchronization and coordination tasks and distributed systems, for example. Um, if you're not convinced, one can even use it to cheat certain games. Kay? So people have proposed that two players who want to play a card game like bridge, actually even though they don't communicate, they can have entanglement, they can kind of cheat this game. So maybe there's some potential for the future, like, you know, Char in 2030, um, hacking using quantum entanglement, uh, possible. Right. 
So of course, you know, like just like uh, um, classically, you can use quantum communication or kind of communication to actually access computers or also to link computers. You can also use quantum communication to either sort of wire up small quantum computers into a large quantum computing cluster to be more powerful, or you can use it in fact to access a um, quantum mainframe. So I don't want to kind of make a statement, of course, that quantum computers will only exist in the basement. Um, but you can think that in the at least somewhat near-term future, quantum computers, I mean, will exist not everywhere, sorry to disappoint you, in your house, um, but they will probably exist in very few places, like our lab in the near-term future, going back to some era known as mainframes. Okay? So you can imagine I have a quantum computer in the basement. Um, you only have a very simple quantum terminal on your desk. And nevertheless, you want to run some kind of interesting computation on that mainframe. So it turns out that, in fact, it is possible to kind of <laughs> compute something on a quantum mainframe in the basement in such a way that you don't need to tell it at all what you're computing. Kay? So it's possible, in fact, with information theoretic security to perform a com com uh, communication um, on a quantum device um, without informing this quantum device what you are actually doing. Okay? So if we kind of want to access quantum computers securely in this way in the future, um, then we also kind of want to send qubits around. So that sounds very well, you know, there's some application. But the question or that might be on your mind is like, why can I not do these things using classical communication? Or rather kind of what makes qubits so special that kind of we can achieve all these kind of tasks while kind of classical communication is less powerful? So of course you've probably all seen all these talks, right? You're probably waiting for me to say that kind of qubits can be both zero and one at the same time. Like uh, they can be in some superposition, a particle can be both left and right at the same time. Maybe you have not, but there's a lot of videos out there that um, uh, will tell you about this. So it is true, kind of qubits are quite special. They can be both zero and one at the same time. But what really kind of gives quantum communication their power are essentially two features of quantum entanglement. So I want to tell you about these two features of quantum entanglement which kind of intuitively at least explain or give you some feeling for what kind of quantum communication is good for and why. So let's imagine that we are kind of have uh, Alice and Bob. We like to talk about Alice and Bob all the time. And let's suppose that they actually have already two qubits, kind of which are depicted by these boxes, and they are actually entangled with each other. So for example, such two entangled qubits can be created by Alice having two qubits, entangling them and sending one over to Bob over the quantum interval. Okay, so now they have two entangled qubits. And now entanglement has a very nice feature, so this is feature number one, namely that even though it does not allow faster than light communication, it allows something which is called maximal correlation. So let me explain what that means. So let's imagine that Alice and Bob are possibly far apart. To make this maybe a bit dramatic, let's imagine that Alice is here on Earth and Bob is on Mars. And they have these entangled qubits. Okay, so Alice has one and Bob has one. So let's imagine that they make a measurement on these qubits. For example, they measure and they want to know, is it, say, red or green? Okay. So the measurement has two possible outcomes. And the cool thing is that even though this measurement outcome does not exist before, okay, so these measurement outcomes are actually randomly generated, if Alice measures and she observes that the particle is red, then Bob, even though he may be arbitrarily far away, also observes this particle to be red. And similarly, if Alice sees that it's green, then Bob will also see that it's green. So remember that I said that these are kind of randomly generated, so they couldn't know this ahead of time. Okay, this does not yet exist. Okay. Nevertheless, whatever outcome Alice gets, Bob gets exactly the same outcome. 
And this, in fact, is true for any measurement that they might make. So not just if they ask if it's like red or green, but for example, if they were to ask, is it like up or pointing up or down? If Alice sees that it's up, Bob will always also see that it's up. So this is feature number one of entanglement, kay? which is called maximal correlation. And that's actually already pretty cool because it's sort of at the heart of why entanglement is extremely good for tasks that require coordination, like synchronizing clocks, for example, or also sort of synchronizing um, things in distributed systems, for example, like um, agreeing on a bit uh, and various other tasks where coordination is kind of the essence. Kay? So having entanglement kind of allows you to coordinate actions much better than can be done classically. Let me now go to feature number two, which is actually pretty cool. So not only does entanglement allow maximum correlation, but entanglement is also what we call inherently private. So let me explain what this means. So if you have Alice and Bob, you might have asked the question, well, you know, Alice has a qubit entangled with Bob's qubit. Maybe, I don't know, there can be a third qubit held by someone else that is just as entangled uh, with these qubits as Alice and Bob. Kay? So maybe it could be that like, his qubit is just as entangled with Alice's qubit as is Bob's qubit. Meaning that they could all be sort of like maximally coordinated at the same time, for example. So the cool thing about entanglement actually is that the answer to this is no. So it is not possible, in fact, for entanglement to be shared. Like if Alice and Bob have two qubits and they're maximally entangled with each other, it is kind of physically impossible for anything else in the universe to have any share of that entanglement. So it's pretty cool, yeah, I agree. <laughs> so this, in fact, follows from all kinds of physical principles. Uh, for example, if this was not true, you could kind of send information faster than light. Um, and physics would actually look very different. Okay. So this is kind of a fundamental feature of quantum entanglement that does not exist in the classical world. Okay. So note that this feature of entanglement actually already also tells you that you cannot just copy qubits. For example, if you could copy qubits, you might imagine that Bob can make a copy of his qubit, give it to his friend, I don't know, turn into a dark side, um, and we would have three qubits which are all equally entangled with each other. So entanglement cannot be shared. This is what's known as the monogamy of entanglement. If two qubits are maximally entangled, nothing else can be entangled. Okay. So this has some very kind of profound consequences, okay, if you think about it. In particular, it means that if we could somehow test whether our qubits are entangled with each other, we know actually that kind of we are inherently private and nothing else can be entangled with our qubits. So the question is, is it sort of possible to make a test that checks whether we are sort of producing entangled qubits or whether maybe there's kind of a third party that has some share of this entanglement? So the answer to this, in fact, is yes. Kay. So this has been kind of... Um, discovered actually um, by John Bell already quite a long time ago, somewhere in uh, 1963. And he observed that kind of if you have entanglement, you can observe certain statistics, certain correlations between different qubits that cannot be generated classically. Okay. So we have no explanation for this. So this means that we have kind of a means to verify essentially whether we are producing entanglement. So before I continue with this, um, let me maybe kind of say that um, by sort of checking or kind of producing such entangled qubits and verifying that they're entangled, and we can actually also see whether kind of these qubits can be described classically or not. Kay? So kind of testing for this entanglement, apart from the fact that it will have very cool applications in the quantum internet, as I explained shortly, 
also tells us something quite fundamental about nature. Namely, it tells us that there are certain sort of correlations between distant systems, say Alice and Bob, that cannot be explained by classical information. It tells us that these kind of measurement outcomes cannot be sort of classically described by say pieces of paper attached to these particles, um, and I just see the answer when I measure. So such tests can actually be performed. Uh, we have performed such a test uh, in 2005. Um, so this is our campus, in fact. So this is kind of where our offices are. And this is at 1.3 kilometers away on the other side of campus. Um, so this, in fact, can be done. So let me now say a little bit kind of about um, the applications of the quantum internet. And I actually want to talk only about the most famous ones, given this is also about char, and you probably also care about um, security. Um, so I let me now explain a little bit how we can exploit these two features of entanglement, kay, so maximum correlation and inherent privacy, um, to communicate information securely. So I'm quite sure that everybody here knows about encryption, but I nevertheless want to be absolutely clear what kind of situation we are considering here, okay? So the situation is as follows. Let's imagine that we have Alice, who wants to, even after she kind of leaves Shah, sort of, I don't know, communicate with Bob. Okay? So we want to transmit a classical message, and we want to encrypt this classical message. So the kind of concern here is that there's someone listening into this communication, so they want their communication to be private from some kind of eavesdropper who's trying to intercept it. And I guess you all know that one way to kind of go around this is, of course, to use encryption. And encryption, of course, requires some kind of key, okay, like many encryption schemes. And in a classical kind of symmetric encryption scheme, for example, Alice has the key, Bob has the same key, and they can use this, I guess, just like in the safe, put the message in the safe, send it across, and if I have the right key, I can open it and recover the message. I'm sure you all know how this kind of works. But the question is now that you might sort of ask yourself is where does this key come from? Or maybe more specifically, how much key do we actually need? So this, some people have actually thought about a long time ago. So there's this really excellent person, Claude Shannon. Um, so there's a very beautiful article, in fact, in the New Yorker, which I highly recommend. And he has established, actually already quite some time ago now, that in order to be absolutely secure, meaning that kind of the eavesdropper generally has no gains no information, kay, it's not like he's not powerful enough or might need a long time, but really there's no way to kind of um, uh, to uh, get the message. You need a key that is just as long as the message. It also means that if you send several messages, like one big message, you need kind of more and more key as you keep sending messages. So this is, of course, a little bit annoying because, I mean, it means that even if Alice and Bob might, say, exchange some key already here at SHA-1, sooner or later, you know, they, they really get to like each other, they want to send more and more pictures to each other, they will run out of key. So it turns out that, in fact, classically, it is impossible without all kinds of computational assumptions, which may or may not be true, to produce key, or in fact to produce more key. So even if Alice and Bob kind of exchange kind of a small amount of key here at SHA-1, and later they run out, there's just no way for them to make more of it. So that may be a question that you might be asking, is why, classically, is it not possible to kind of turn a small key into a larger key? or to make any key at all. So classically, information can be copied. This means that if Alice sends a message over to Bob, and the eavesdropper can intercept it, in fact, the eavesdropper can kind of read anything on this communication channel, the eavesdropper knows exactly as much as Bob. Kay? So eavesdropper knows just as much as Bob does, but Bob is, of course, supposed to learn the key. There must be a way for Bob to learn the key, otherwise Alice and Bob cannot change inf exchange information later. So if there's a procedure for Bob to kind of learn the key, of course, also the eavesdropper, who has exactly as much information, is also able, in principle, to learn the key. So kind of this is very intuitive why, in fact, it is not possible, classically, 
to produce more keys. So the cool thing is actually that using quantum communication, it is possible. And like I said, I want to kind of exploit, explain to you how these two features of entanglement actually make that possible. So you might be surprised that actually the theoretical ideas of uh, um, quantum key distribution um, go back a long way, in fact, to the 70s, where, of course, people could not send qubits. Like, this was a totally, absolutely theoretical idea at this point in time. Um, but nevertheless, it, it was observed, actually, already by Stephen Wiesner, um, that this, in principle, might be possible. So, of course, we're a little bit further along. So people have proposed schemes. And I want to give you an intuition, actually, about this beautiful way of looking at quantum key distribution um, put forward by Arthur Eckert in 99 that exploits precisely these features of entanglement. So QKD, quantum key distribution, from entanglement works as follows. So I'm going to give you like a cartoon of this protocol. Of course, to make this work exactly, it's a bit more complicated. So I already told you that kind of entanglement is very useful. So let's think about how we're going to produce Q's entanglement to make keys. So kind of a cartoon version of this protocol works as follows. Alice produces two qubits, which are entangled with each other, and sends one of them over to Bob. Of course, somewhere on the way, maybe the eavesdropper is intercepting it, we don't know. So we're going to do this very, very many times. Remember that we know that Alice and Bob can check whether their qubits are entangled with each other. Kay? So what they're going to do is they're going to send very many qubits across, and some of these qubits they're going to test. And they're going to ask, are these qubits still entangled? Yes or no? In fact, like I said, things are a bit more complicated. In fact, one can test precisely how entangled they are. Uh, but Alice and Bob are going to perform this test. So if the test succeeds, then they're going to measure their entangled qubits to produce a key. So I've given you these two properties of entanglement, and I want to now use them to explain why such a protocol might actually work. So can someone remind me what is feature one of entanglement? So they're inherently private, exactly. So this was one of the features. What is the other feature? Correlation. Okay, very good. So note that any kind of key exchange system, before we even start caring about security, it certainly must make sure that Alice and Bob have the same key. Okay, otherwise they cannot communicate. Okay. So the theme should be correct, which means that they should have the same key. So let's remember that entanglement kind of achieves maximum correlation. This means that if they measure the entangled pair, they get a random outcome, so either red or green, but they both get the same. Kay? So if we were to use this outcome as a key, certainly we've achieved task number one of any key distribution scheme, namely that they actually have the same key. Kay. So I was reminded, in fact, that indeed entanglement is also inherently private. So this means that if Alice and Bob actually have entangled qubits, then we know that nothing else in the universe, in particular any eavesdropper that kind of tried to intercept this entanglement, can have any part of this entanglement, meaning that also the key is completely private because nothing else can have share of this entanglement. So this is kind of how these two features of entanglement lead to sec security of quantum key distribution. Of course, I mean, things are not so, so easy in practice. You know, in practice, there will be some error on the channel. They will be somewhat entangled. So they have to kind of do some error correction and, um, and private them sufficiently. But this is really the sort of essence or the intuition of why quantum key distribution works. And we again see here why also, like, classically, this cannot be achieved. So this, of course, you can achieve. You can always achieve maximum correlation. I could, for example, just send the bits to Bob. Everybody knows them. Bob knows them. Eavesdropper also knows them. But kind of entanglement ensures that this is also private. All right. So I've been telling you that with entanglement, one can do all these cool things. So you're possibly asking, actually, what is the state of the art? 
And actually, I wanted to start with something very recent, <coughs> which was done by a Chinese group, which is in space, um, which has entanglement generated entanglement of the distance of uh, 1,203 kilometers via satellite. So this is an amazing achievement of engineering. So you can imagine that just like in, in a classical internet, we will have sort of ground-based networks to connect nearby areas, say Netherlands, and we will have satellites to sort of bridge very long distances, or longer distances than on Earth. So this, in fact, can be done. It is relatively slow, so entanglement is generated at the rate of one hertz, so one of roughly one per second, over such a large field. So on the ground, in fact, um, uh, communication is relatively mature at short distances. In fact, if you wanted to do quantum key distribution and you only care about short distances, you could buy one of these boxes, like made by my ID Quantique, Huawei or Toshiba. You can install it and you can plug in some fiber and generate keys. <coughs> so the kind of grand challenge of quantum communication is to, in fact, bridge these long distances. So if you Google around on the internet, you may also learn that there are sort of ground-based networks. <coughs> then you, they might kind of indicate, you might think that they're already very large, for example, from Beijing to Shanghai, I guess it's not so visible on the slide. Um, but these currently do not yet allow the end-to-end -end qubit transmission. Yeah, so these are called trusted repeater networks, which are sort of a trivial extension of what I've just described. So let's say that Alice and Bob are kind of too far away to kind of use one of these I guess currently commercially available CKD systems, but they can ask the help of their friend. Okay. So Alice could kind of make a key with her friend, Bob could make a key with this guy, and of course, as long as they trust him, they can then kind of do end-to-end -end communication. So this, of course, has some nice engineering and kind of allows you to kind of test certain deployment, <coughs> but of course, this is not what one wants to achieve. Okay. So in fact, true kind of quantum communication from end-to-end -end does not need the trust of an intermediary person. Because I guess we all know how that ended. Um, but yeah. Kay. So the question is sort of like, given that we can do quantum communication at short distances, how can we go beyond that? And of course you might ask the question is, why is long distance quantum communication actually difficult? And there's essentially two reasons for this. One of which, which I've already alluded to. Namely that it is fundamentally impossible to kind of copy arbitrary qubits. So this is kind of a problem because it kind of means that we also cannot try again. So repetition is ruled out as a means to correct error. Currently I'm wearing a microphone, usually I don't talk so loud, but if you don't hear me, I can just repeat the information, I can resend it, um, and I can overcome losses. This is not possible using quantum communication. If I want to send a qubit and I lose the qubit, there's no way that I can sort of have copied it and, and resend it. So the second reason, so this is kind of a fundamental reason, the second one is a technological reason, in the sense that it's very difficult, or I guess currently still very difficult, to manipulate many qubits at the same time. So if you're kind of following the news on quantum computing, like um, sort of m the largest general purpose, like I guess, for any kind of um, computer, it's only 17 qubits. Okay? So this also means that we cannot do large-scale error correction. So it is in fact possible, just like in classical communication, that even though I cannot copy qubits, I can sort of dilute them, I can sort of add some redundancy, such that if some of these qubits are lost or destroyed, I can nevertheless recover the original qubit okay, from the error correction. So, of course, doing error correction means that I need to manipulate the entire error-correcting code. I need to perform such an error-correcting encoding and I need to decode. Okay. So of course it's desirable to sort of avoid large-scale, the need for large-scale quantum communication to bridge large distances. So how can one nevertheless kind of hope to bridge large distances? So there's a very neat trick to this, which is based on something called quantum teleportation. I'm sure uh, many of you have heard about this before. But it, it in this context gives a very cool feature to actually transmit qubits. So how can we actually transmit qubits? Okay, so one of them, of course, is to by direct transmission. I have a quantum channel, for example, a telecom fiber, and I send my qubits using 
a photon. Okay, so I sent a particle of light. Another way to send qubits is by using teleportation. Okay? So let's for the moment imagine that Alice and Bob already had entanglement. Okay, for some reason, they've already managed to have two qubits that are entangled with each other. And we're also going to allow them to communicate classically, for example, over the standard internet. So quantum teleportation allows us to use this entanglement to now send a qubit. Okay, so how does this work? Alice is going to perform a measurement on, say, the qubit that she wants to send and the entangled qubit. She's going to kind of get some kind of measurement outcome, which is going to send to Bob. So Bob still has the qubit, like from his uh, end of the entanglement. And based on the measurement outcome, he can apply correction information and recover the qubit. So you might say, you know, this is all very great. Why do I care about that? Because first, of course, where does the entanglement come from? First, I need to make the entanglement, then I can teleport. So what have I gained? So the cool thing about first making entanglement is actually twofold. First of all, note that if I produce entanglement, I know exactly what quantum state I want to do. I can build a machine that tries in producing this entanglement very many times. This also means that kind of if I send kind of entangled qubits, I can now try several times. So repetition is again kind of allowed as a means to correct error because I know exactly what I want to do. Okay, so I have a machine that produces entanglement all the time. Once I succeed, I can teleport the qubit. So this is one cool feature. But the other cool feature can actually be used to bridge long distances. And this is what is called a quantum repeater. So let me give you a little bit of a cartoon here. So every one of my kind of blue kind of mm, circles is a little quantum computer. Okay, So this is, say, Alice's. This is the repeater station in the middle. And this one is the one of Bob. And let's now imagine that kind of using these colored balls up here, Alice and this intermediate repeater station already have made entangled qubits. For example, because Alice is very close to the repeater station, she prepares two qubits, sends one of them to the repeater station. Kay. So let's do this again. Okay. So Bob and the repeater station are also quite close to each other. So Bob can, or the repeater station, can make two qubits that are entangled and send one of them onto Bob. So now we're in the situation above. So Alice has entanglement with repeater. Repeater has entanglement with Bob. So note that teleportation is able to teleport any qubit. In particular, it can be used to teleport one of these qubits from the repeater to Bob. Kay. So this means that I'm kind of consuming the entanglement here. But the entanglement that Alice has with the repeater is now transferred to entanglement between Alice and Bob. Kay. So now, suddenly, I have entanglement over longer distances. Now I have entanglement over distances where they could not directly transmit qubits. All right, that's great. But now we know that we have entanglement over large distance. And now we can use this entanglement to teleport the qubit across. So this is kind of the basic idea of quantum repeaters, that you first make entanglement, and then you transmit qubits by teleportation. Okay, so like I said, again, this is nice because one can try again. And also the operations are actually reasonably simple. So if I can go back to my cartoon of a kind of quantum network, which really is not a cartoon yet, apart from these sort of quantum computers at the end, um, one also needs to realize these quantum repeaters, kind of in this intermediary station, that allow us to generate entanglement over long distances. So let me now say a little bit kind of about the state of the art. So there exist kind of several systems. Uh, we have one um, which is called MD centers in diamonds. Um, so these indeed are indeed diamonds. They're of course not natural diamonds. They are um, artificial diamonds. And you can think that they're kind of small quantum computers. So in fact, like a diamond, if it was completely pure, um, this would have no qubits. But one introduces defects into this. In fact, they're called color centers. It's what gives diamonds their sparkle. And in each of these kind of defects, um, there are several qubits that can be addressed optically. Kay? So they have roughly six qubits. In principle, one could address more. Um, one cannot store these qubits forever, so at least right now. Um, 
and one can generate entanglement between between such two sort of diamonds um, over some distance. So this is kind of the system that we are using on the railway. Just a few more. For example, one of them was our collaborator with Tracy um, in Innsbruck, and there's also Chris Monroe in the US. There's also a few groups in, in the US at MIT and Harvard which also have diamond systems. So what does this look like? Okay, so this is what it looks like. There's like a diamond. It is kind of mounted on this chip, which you can see here. And it's actually cooled down to four Kelvins. And uh, indeed, in this diamond, there's an electron spin. And in the vicinity, there are several kind of nuclear spins, which are qubits. So I guess I don't want to say too much about this. Um, but because my talk, I guess, was also called, I guess, the invitation to consider a quantum internet, I want to talk a little bit now about kind of some of the sort of classical problems, which are actually not, it's nothing so much to do with, say, quantum hardware itself, that would need to be solved, in fact, in order to realize a quantum internet. In fact, also to do meaningful things with a quantum internet. So I guess you all know that kind of the classical internet also does not work just based on hardware. Kay? So if I were to describe a protocol that says, you know, I don't know, Alice sends a message to Bob, then that's great. But like, how does the message actually go to Bob? Okay, somewhere in your lab, or I guess you, I guess, or like on your computer, um, there's a piece of hardware that, um, as if you don't run anything on your computer, it will do exactly nothing. Okay. So the question is sort of like how kind of um, uh, um, do these kind of applications, how are they actually sort of realized on this underlying hardware? And I should say that actually this is something that is currently quite open. We are currently trying, in fact, we have cooked up all kinds of sort of intermediary protocols to talk about this. And I want to kind of give you only one kind of uh, example, in fact, that already illustrates that in fact also the kind of classical network stack that maybe some of you all know and love kind of needs some extensions here. So let me remind you kind of of what kind of an IP packet looks like. Of course it says like where's the packet going to, where does it come from? But in particular it also has this thing down here, namely the data. So it's sort of convenient that I can here send the data together with the classical control information over the same wire. That's kind of convenient, and they rise all nicely together. So this is not possible here in this kind of quantum hardware, because the qubits live inside this device, and the kind of classical control information is sent over a kind of a classical channel next to the quantum channel. So the first thing, in fact, that we need is some kind of layer that combines kind of these qubits with this kind of classical control information. Simple sort of first step. Okay, so we've kind of defined such a thing. If you remember now how I have said we are going to actually transmit qubits, namely by teleporting them, you immediately see that kind of we also need sort of a protocol to keep track of this entanglement. In fact, I can already generate entanglement over very long distances. Okay, maybe I swap in the background. There's some background process in my network that continuously produces entanglement, um, but I need to keep track of it. If you wanted to kind of go a little bit further up, you can think about kind of how do we actually route qubits around. Yes, I can send them over the kind of from one end to the other. But if you think about that we can send qubits by teleportation, it's sort of obvious that in fact I could maybe, if that's convenient, I always communicate sort of over a particular place long distance away, I could generate such long distance entanglement ahead of time. Okay. So kind of routing can be quite dynamic actually if I can produce entanglement. So these are all sort of questions which um, I guess we are currently thinking about, which are quite, I guess I find them quite exciting and interesting, um, which are kind of currently in fact unsolved, um, but which of course are needed if you want to kind of do quantum communication uh, over large distances in a meaningful way to actually do something interesting. So in order to do this, I guess, um, um, well, we will. We are still writing some documentation, so it's easier to kind of understand this. Um, we have actually, I guess, this is mainly mainly mentioned for you or for the community, um, to kind of uh, we have a simulator, in fact, which will simulate qubits for you. So you can install this on your computer, I guess on my computer, on your computer. Somewhere in the background, these kind of will talk to each other, 
and pretend to have qubits. So you can basically have it right, so there's a classical client that can communicate with a sort of back um, simulation and it also for God. And you can kind of ask it to create qubits, measure qubits, send instructions to the qubits, send the qubits around to the other nodes. Okay. So kind of our simulator can be programmed directly in Python or Twisted. This is of course not exactly how we're going to program this. So we're aiming to actually want to release it completely publicly and to put the same interface as we will use um, on our 2020 demonstration website. Yeah, so I will announce this on Twitter once we kind of have the tea data if you're interested. Okay, and of course you can now explore sort of like actually what do I need to do on this kind of classical layer of communication to kind of control and keep track of the entanglement here to send qubits around meaningfully and to actually realize the application. I'm nearing the end of my talk. I also have a very shameless estimate for the somewhat younger people around here. Um, so we do have kind of a master program uh, at uh, QTEC um, for uh, XMM students. Um, so if you want to feel challenged and join us in this endeavor, you can talk to me. You might ask actually, what is QTEC? Well, like I said, we are a collaboration between Q Delft and Q Know. Um, so I guess uh, Q Know, Q Know, that's where it's kind of applied research. We are what is called the national icon of the Netherlands. Um, uh, so we have all kinds of support in order to realize these things. Um, so our goal is to realize a quantum computer and obviously a quantum internet. Um, and we also have some partnerships around here. So if you want to do more about this, kind of stay tuned for the release of this um, um, simulacron. Um, I taught a class on edX last fall, which will actually run again this fall. So if you want, you can follow it online. It will go online on the 14th of November. And for more information, see our website. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, we still we have a few 10 minutes yep. uh, left for Q&A. Uh, we have 10 minutes for Q&A, so if you would line up uh, at the two microphones, uh, I will call you up. So first question, please. Wait, wait a second. <laughs> Try again. What? We, we, we can't hear you on the stream, sorry. <laughs> okay. So the first one, the, the one in the front is not working, so please line up at the second one. <laughs> It seems that the security of the system depends on being able to only entangle two qubits. Yes. Uh, is there some physical property that prevents you from entangling uh, more than two in such a way that would allow uh, a uh, Alice to share the qubit with the dark side? Yeah, so like I've just explained, so like um, uh, it is in fact physically impossible for three qubits to be equally entangled as two. Um, in fact, if this would be possible, one in fact could send information faster than light, clone qubits, actually uh, uh, do all kinds of things <laughs> which are quite magical. And in fact, there is a test, namely the spell test, um, that will verify, kind of, that will only kind of succeed if two qubits are kind of sufficiently entangled that I can rule out the entanglement with the third qubit. So like basically you, you do this many times, you kind of check on a, s on a kind of subset um, whether they're entangled meaning that I rule out that a third qubit is equally entangled with that. So this also means that like, if the eavesdropper, for example, who's in fact allowed to have a quantum computer, an arbitrary large quantum member, in fact allowed to control the entire rest of the universe, has sort of tried to intercept part of this entanglement, one will detect that. In fact, I should s I've talked here about always like the extreme points, like you know, maximal entanglement, no entanglement. From this test, one can essentially measure a number and from this one can make, in fact, a very quantitative estimate of exactly how entangled this other qubit can be and how much information the eavesdropper can have gained. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, I have a question, like uh, six qubits, you said actually two questions, but six qubits, is that equal to like six bits of information you can send at one time or would it be more information? Uh, so like... Uh, at one time, like of course you can send kind of one qubit to each other, like these qubits are actually mostly useful as a memory in a local processor. Okay, so like you can of course keep more sending more qubits, 
um, but you, it means that you can store six of them at any one time. Um, how fast is it going to grow in the uh, current future? Because now you're at six qubits. Is it going quickly, or are we kind of stagnated at six? Or um, so, I mean, there's, uh, there's a question of priorities here, of course, kind of in the quantum computing domain. Like, uh, you want to have more and more qubits. In fact, like, uh, in, in, for example, superconducting qubits, you can already have 17. Um, uh, so their qubits are actually growing quite fast. So note that the kind of qubits that you want or the kind of hardware for computation and communication is a little bit different. So for computation, you want to do very many gates very quickly. And of course, you might also want large number of qubits. But you also don't need to store them for very long. So if you want to do a communication task, you, it may be, it's less important that you have many qubits because a lot of these tasks actually need only one. Um, but you also need a system where maybe the gate speeds are not so important, but you want to store for a longer time. Namely, long because you have might have a protocol that requires Alice and Bob to sort of exchange classical messages, so you need to wait until that message arrives before you can kind of continue. So this is actually why here the objective is not to kind of go to very many qubits, but rather to store increase the storage time. Yeah. yeah. Next question, please. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, so basically, as I understand quantum things, there are some strange type of ways. And um, when you tell me that the quantum error correction requires multiple qubits, I think multiple waves, and I think a uh, Nyquist probing theorem, that you need more and more resolution, the more error correction you do. Isn't this prohibitive if you want to send large packets with error correction? Yeah, so note that actually like here, like one is really only using some extremely small scale error correction, because the majority of the errors is actually not kind of corrected by errors, but by repetition. Um, so, but you let me transfer your question to the computing domain, where actually one wants to kind of use large-scale error correcting codes. Um, uh, so there, of course, like it is quite challenging to kind of build large-scale error correcting codes. To be honest, like given from a totally practical perspective, I would actually be less worried about sort of the theoretical existence of large-scale error correcting codes. Kind of, I think they can probably be realized. But um, again, like here. Just like in the in like just like in the communication domain, there's a lot of need in the computing domain for the development of, say, classical control and algorithms to actually perform that error correction. So one of the reasons, in fact, why it's difficult to do, say, large-scale error correction is not necessarily all just the number of qubits, but it's the fact that you need an error correction algorithm that very quickly decides what to do, and kind of which qubits to correct. Okay. So this is, in fact, one of the main challenges, which is not so much quantum, but it's actually classical. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Another question? Excellent. Hello. You mentioned that you can use quantum internet in clock synchronization. Uh, how does it work? Because I know it, that now the constraint is because of the latency. And do we reduce latency to zero and we get better synchronization or we have some out of the box uh, other solutions? So actually, we can talk after that. It's a bit complicated to explain that. So let me explain something slightly simpler, OK? Um, so let's actually imagine that I want to say measure, say, a relative phase shift between two things that happen at the same time. So let's say that, like, I don't know, something is turning here, or something is turning over there. And I want to know sort of how much faster is this one as opposed to that one. Um, so in fact, using entanglement, one can, in fact, accumulate this phase drift into the entangled state and then read it out from there. So this is actually not just used for clock synchronization. There's also, say, applications where people use this for sensing. For example, to kind of uh, there's proposals to use entanglement to detect sort of field changes in the magnetic field on Earth. Uh, I guess to find things in the ground, which may be a, a useful application. But um, uh, so, but this works basically by transferring the phase. So this is quite similar. If you want to know exactly how one uses this to synchronize clocks, then that's more complicated. But we can talk about that. Excellent. Another one? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. How, how fast can you communicate between the qubits? I how fast can we communicate? Yeah. That is a good question. I should say that currently our goal, also for this 2020 demo, is not to kind of go as far, like, speed is here not the objective. Currently, we want to kind of make it possible to communicate long distances and, I guess, also connect these quantum processors. Like, um, so, Kind of QKD systems at like short distances can go extremely high. They can do, do megahertz. 
but we are not doing that. We are in the regime of Hertz, okay? So we're communicating qubits per second. Okay, but, <laughs> oh, sorry. My basic understanding was that if you change one of the qubits, the other, the other changes too. Uh -huh. so How fast? Okay, so let me uh, kind of answer this question. So there's a difference between communication and correlation. So, like, this happens instantaneously. So if Alice sees red, Bob does not need to wait until it also he also sees red. And if Alice sees green, instantaneously Bob will also see green. Okay? In fact, it does not matter who measures first. Kind of they will always get the same outcome. So this kind of correlation is instantaneous, which is also why the entanglement is very cool for kind of um, coordination tasks, because you have sort of instantaneous coordination. So the question is now kind of why does this, uh, why is this different from communication? In particular, you might ask, you know, why does this not allow me to send information faster than light? Okay. So remember that I said that kind of this outcome is random, okay? So like they will either see both red or they will both see green. Uh, in fact, this is random. They cannot kind of determine this ahead of time. But this also means that they cannot use this entanglement to communicate. You know, like they get a random bit, which is totally correlated, which is very cool, like for making key and, and kind of synchronizing other kind of tasks. Um, but they cannot kind of use this bit to communicate. Uh, if they want to teleport something, maybe you remember my slide, then we needed to send this kind of measurement outcome to the other side. And you can think that, in fact, before I do that, the sort of Bob only has an encrypted qubit. He does know not how to interpret this until this measurement outcome arrives and he can apply that correction information. So this, of course, takes time so fast than light is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Wait, could, could we I <laughs> said Roger. <laughs> <laughs> could we, one, one quick question and one quick answer, please. Okay, yes. Um, I actually had uh, three qu quick questions. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so, how big is the test environment going to be? Is it for what you can currently do or what you expect to, to do? Um, is there still a DDoS problem in networks so that... Uh, is there what problem? I didn't a, hear. A, a denial of service problem with quantum networks. And uh, why didn't you design the Dutch network to look like the uh, pre-internet version instead of a square, make it a triangle with a, with a point? Yeah, um, uh, good question. You know, we have constraints. Um, we have people who give us space to put places. And uh, we have also a fiber from KPN. Um, so we are a little bit constrained. We cannot put it everywhere. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so um, uh, I mean, of course, like we are aiming to sort of, um, we would like, of course, to have a larger network. But you know, like even together with TNO, like we are uh, a research institute doing something that no one has ever done before. Okay? So currently we are trying to make something that kind of works. And, but in order to sort of like make this widespread, um, uh, you would need some much more industrialized process than, than what we are doing now. Yeah. So, I don't know, like some long term future. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah. thank you very much. Once more, please give a big round of applause for Stephanie.